Okay, so let's get on. Let's get to. Uh, we're going to talk today a little bit more about the betrayal of the Lord. So let's go to John chapter eighteen. I am sure that nobody has felt as betrayed as our Lord has. At least, that, not that I've ever heard of. <clears throat> uh, in fact, nobody has been as humiliated as our Lord has. Uh, the humiliation that our, our Savior went through uh, surpasses anything. I think that any, at least that I've ever heard of, maybe not, I don't know, but it's what I've ever heard, it surpasses all of that. Uh, but his exaltation later on also surpasses anything that we'll, we'll see. So you can't have the exaltation of the Lord without his humiliation, at least in the eyes. Now, not that he wasn't God before that time, but in the eyes of those of us who are saved, he will be exalted one day as a result of his humiliation. So uh, it's uh, black and white goes together, right? Good and bad, there's always a balance there. Uh, so we... Um, all right, we want to look here, and we want to try to get the sense of, of what the, the Lord was going through here. Uh, when it says that he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, um, this is certain, you'll, you'll see that. So here, uh, the Lord has spent now a number of years training uh, some men for the ministry. He's put time in with them. He's, he's taught them things. He's taught them how to pray. He's been an example to them. He's... Um, you know, showed them, tried to prepare them, tried, he told them about the future, he told them what was going to happen, all of these things. He uh, handpicked them, he chose them, and uh, got to know them, undoubtedly, got to know their family. We know that he was in Peter's mother-in-law's house, right? So we, we gather that he knew their family too. He was uh, um, involved in our lives, he knew them, he, he was, it was ministry. And those same people, at the time when he needed them the most, they were, they were gone. Okay, so I think of Pastor Lewis's, let's not forget his message, that idea of breaking earthly ties. You know, a lot of us maybe can't exactly relate to what he went through, although uh, I can impart, I don't know if all of you know this, but I have no idea who my mother is. I have no idea who she is. I have a brother too, I have no idea who that is. Uh, I've, I've lived my life with, with my stepmother, I know her as my mom, but in that, uh, that's how I know Spanish also, and so I'm able to use that for the Lord. So, you know, God is good. Um, but I have no idea who my mother is, no idea. And she doesn't want to know who I am. I've tried to contact her a number of times. She, is, she wants nothing to do with it. Um, and I've got a brother, too. And he's actually older than I am. And uh, his name is Douglas. And uh, th th so there is a Douglas Shriver in this world. As far as I know, I mean, maybe he's not around either. I have no idea. But I think about, you know, the, the, the breaking up of families and things. You know, my dad passed away three years ago. I don't think my brother even knows that. I don't think he has any idea that his dad is dead. No idea. Now, can you imagine that? <laughs> Maybe some of you can imagine it. I don't know. I don't know your, your, your history. Maybe you can. You can relate to that. So I can in part relate to some of that. But uh, any earthly tie, all of it. Okay, so um, Pastor Lewis and I have that in common, that we've had a parent that has abandoned us. But, you know, it doesn't matter. Your, your parents are not going to be around forever. They're not. So whether it happens when you're younger or when it happens when you're really older, it's an earthly tie here, and it's not going to be wrong forever. Uh, your friends and all this. So you can't put a whole lot of stake in that. And I think that's, that's very... And so when he said that, it kind of clicked with me. How much dependence do we put? How, how much grief do we really grieve over loss of things here on earth? Well, it's going to happen. As much as we know that we're going to die, we know we're going to be separated from the things of, of, of this earth, and that includes anything at all. And so I think that, that that was a very good preparation for the preaching conference because it helps us to help us to separate it. You know, we say we're separated from the world, but I think maybe true separation from the world is not putting too much stock in any earthly ties at all. So, um, and then of course it's good when you do that to listen to preaching after that. So I think it was a good intro to that. I think the Lord put that together. Knowing some of those things, we look at the Lord's life here, and we see all that he's gone through. Now, how much betrayal would he, he have quit? Now, did he put a lot of dependence on earthly time? Well, he was human, okay? He was a perfect human, but he was human. Uh, our sentiments are towards things here on earth, okay? I, I, none of us are so cold. As, okay, so if, if, if the Lord were to take my wife and my kids today, tomorrow, whatever, would, would I be grieved? Of course. I'm, I'm not going to be that... Um, brass or bold to say that I'm so separated from earthly ties that, that wouldn't bother me. It would terribly bother me. I don't know how I go through it. Um, but 
Uh, but the Lord helps you through those things. That's who does it. So in ministry, I think that a lot of times there's, a, I'm not saying that there, there's more grief in ministry than the people in the world. I'm not saying that at all. But I do think in the area of betrayal, uh, that is something that, that, it, that can be felt very, very deeply. Uh, I, can, there, I was in a church where one of the, the leading deacons in that church just left. You know, he just got up and left. Um, and it was a good family. It was a family that uh, was always considered to be a blessing to that church. Well, he left. Okay? So it, it made, and it wasn't too long after I got there that, that happened. And I saw what it did to the pastor. And I, was, I didn't really know much about the, that sort of thing, but I, I saw what it did. And, uh, you know, that hurts. You put a lot of prayer, a lot of time, and it hurt him very, very deeply. So he, was, he felt betrayed. Uh, you put your faith in somebody and they don't come through. But it happens, doesn't it? Now, um, somebody saying, hey, I'm going to the store. You need something? Yeah, give me a Coke. And he comes back and he forgot that he got a Coke. Well, that's that's a maybe slight betrayal. <laughs> it's a little bit of betrayal. But I think you can live through that one okay. You'll call him an idiot, you know, or whatever, and just get over it. But when you put time into it, real, real, now you haven't put, a, you didn't invest a whole lot of time into praying for that Coke. I doubt it, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe you did, but I, I doubt it. Um, so that's not the big deal. So I think we understand that the amount of time and effort and investment that you put into somebody is proportional to how much you'll feel betrayed. But so some people take, and this is what happened also to that pastor, I think. He started to pull away and not invest so much into it because he didn't want to go through that again. Now listen to me, that's a danger. Okay? You can't do that. All right? You open yourself up to betrayal whenever you um, invest effort and time into something. You always do. But your strength is in the Lord. He will never betray you. And that's the thing we have to remember. So, uh, the Lord here is in the, in the Last Supper. And we uh, see in verse 2, and I won't um, read all the way through there. But uh, let's pick it up in verse... Well, yes, I will. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his, with his disciples over the brook Cedron, where was a garden into, the, into which he entered, and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. So there was a place there that he would go with them. And what would they do there? Sometimes they would rest, they would pray together, they would get to know each other a little bit better, they would talk about the things that went on in the ministry, that sort of thing, undoubtedly. And Judas, uh, sorry, Judas then having received a band of men, um, in other Gospels it says a multitude, here it says a band of men, in others it says a multitude of soldiers and things, so and we put all the Gospel accounts together and we come up with the fact that there was quite a few, a lot more than what you might think. In fact, there was probably in the hundreds of people that came. And they had lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him. Okay, now that's important. Okay, he, know, he knows all things that should come upon him. So when this betrayal in the, in the garden, was it a surprise to him? No, we, we see it very clearly it was not. And we talk a little bit later, later why it had to be a betrayal. That's going to come into play. Uh, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. He didn't stand with the disciples. He stood with them. And as soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell into the ground. This is the only gospel account. The gospel of John is the only gospel account that gives that part of it. Um, and I think it's the book of Matthew is the only one that gives the idea of that, that, that person, that uh, young man in a, a loincloth, or, you know, he was, had a robe around him, and they grabbed him, and he fled naked. He says that. That's the only account that gives that. I, I read some of those things, and I think, why is that in there? But it is, for some reason, and most commentators think that uh, that person that fled away was just somebody that was stirred from his sleep. He was sleeping there close by or something, and he was stirred from his sleep, went out to see what was going on, and he ends up losing his robe. Uh, that's what they say it is. Um, so, yes? I've always heard it was John Mark. I, I haven't always heard that, but I've heard that before, yeah. But, but uh, that is pr I, the way I look at it, it's pretty hard to prove that. You know? We see later on that, of course, John was, uh, um, or, 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 oh, you're saying John Mark as opposed to the Apostle John. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it could be, but I think that's surmising. Uh, nothing really says that. Um, so, as soon as he said to them, I am he, he went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, whom seek ye? So they get up, apparently, right? Why do they fall back? Well, 
The only thing I can come up with is just the power of God. He says, I am he. That's a title. And I wasn't speaking English. I have to remember that. So that's a title. And it's just the power of God. The Gospel of John that presents Christ as in his deity. It would make sense that he would um, give that account. So then he asked, I, said, I suppose they get up. What in the world was that? Can you imagine what was going through their mind? <laughs> what in the world? And, and they get back up again, brush themselves off, looking around. And so Jesus asked them again, Whom seek ye? And they said again, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Now this time he says the I am, and nothing happens, apparently. If therefore ye seek me, let those go, hither, go their way. And he's talking about his other apostles. And uh, that the saying, now that was fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Here John brings that out, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spake of them, which thou gavest me, have I lost none. <clears throat> so here again, just his very words there is a fulfillment of prophecy. And then Simon Peter, our buddy, the uh, uh, rash one, if you will, having a sword. Now, if you remember, there were, these, there were two swords, actually, that they have, that they had. And uh, Jesus said, that it is enough. So he grabs a sword. Now, is he fulfilling what he said he was going to do here? Peter, remember Peter said, and it's three times, we'll go through this in a minute too, I will never leave you. I'll defend you. Even though everybody else flees, I'm not going to. So here is, is he, is he uh, uh, backing up what he said? I think he is. Right? So he grabs a sword and drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. Now that, that would be pretty hard to do. Okay, I thought about that a little bit. Now, if I'm looking at Sarah, I can't even see her right ear. It, there yeah. it is. So if I say, okay, yeah, there it is. So if I say, okay, now I'm not going to, I'm just going to get her ear. You got to be pretty good. You know, you got to, <laughs> and was it, was it her entire ear? Was it a piece of it? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, but it wouldn't be easy to do. So I gather probably his intention wasn't, I don't think Peter drew his sword and said, I'm going to cut that right ear right off. I don't like it. It's a disgusting. He's got entire, <laughs> he has entirely too much wax in there. And so I, I'm, I'm just going to get rid of it. You know, I don't like it. I'm, it's detestable and repugnant to me, that ear. So I'm going to get rid of it. So I, th I think probably, you know, he probably dodged or something. He got his ear. And the servant's name was Malchus. And then said Jesus unto Peter, put up thy sword into the sheath, the cup which my father hath given me. Shall I not drink it? So here we see the cup again. Pretty in good indication there. Um, and then the band and the captain and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away. Now, Luke's account tells us that uh, the Lord healed Malchus's ear. Um, and maybe the understanding could be, well, of course, if, if he hadn't done so, because this is a high priest servant, it would have been a crime to have, uh, to, to have harmed that. He would have been... Uh, considered a, a, a sedition or maybe even to some degree or you know, working against the state, against the government. So they say that the Lord was keeping Peter from being arrested and, and that prop, Old Testament prophecy that he has kept all of them would have been fulfilled even in his healing of the ear there. <laughs> and led him away to Annas first and for he was a father-in-law to Caiaphas. We go into that pretty, pretty good detail in New Testament history, which was the high priest that same year. Now, Caiaphas was, now Caiaphas is his son-in-law. Now, Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die <coughs> for the people. So that was um, a, a pronouncement that Caiaphas made. And so uh, here John is telling us that it was the same Caiaphas. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. We presume that to be John, just simply because he uses that title of himself often. So we can maybe assume it is. But Peter stood at the door without, and then went out with that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. And then saith the damsel that kept, now we, we assume this is a door to a court, right? Um, so, but it would have been close enough for Peter to have seen the Lord scourged. Uh, then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, art, thou, art not thou also one of this man's disciples? He saith, I am not. Now it says, art, thou, art not thou also? Now what, what would that mean to you? Would that mean grammatically that there was another apostle that came forth and mentioned that he was a disciple of the Lord? Would it have been the person that uh, I talked to the girl at the door there? If that's the case, then it would have been, the, Peter would have had less reason to, to deny the Lord here because there was another apostle who apparently admitted that he was a disciple and nothing was done to him. So if that was the case, Peter would have had less of an excuse. 
So he says, I am not, and then, of course, he denies him three times. Another three in Peter's life. Um, the high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine, and uh, he goes on, and we have the discussion between them. Then he's brought before Pilate, and we see that all the way through uh, to the end of verse 40 there. Okay, so let's begin then. Uh, the first thing we're going to look at um, is Jesus' betrayal. <coughs> And let's just come up with some points here. Okay, um, this was early morning, just after midnight, and we, we have Judas's army. And we talked about that. It was a, brand, a band of soldiers, uh, or of men, it says in John, a great multitude in the other Gospels, it says. And so they came there. Uh, they were, there were a lot of people there. It was midnight, it was the middle of the night. Now, which are the people that would have been awake? So we put a couple of uh, facts together. Who would have been the people that were awake probably in the midnight hour? Likely, it would have been the, the soldiers there keeping the city. Now, in New Testament history, we learned that the Roman uh, contingency of soldiers that were there uh, many times were just in place there, probably took turns, okay, uh, keeping guard over the city because of the strife and the difficulties that they had there. So it was probably these. Likely Judas went to those soldiers and said, we have a problem here. Uh, something is, going, is, is being stirred up here. You should come and, and see. Now, of course, he did that because of the bribe of money. But nonetheless, uh, there were soldiers always in place there waiting to uh, dispel or to... Um, you know, reduce the, the, uh, the advancement of any difficulty that might be in the city. So he probably went to them. They listened to him. They went to the Lord in the garden there, and he was going to designate who it was that was the problem, the problem maker. And then the soldiers, of course, would have taken care of him. This was the idea. So all of that history between the Jews and the Rome culminates here, or at least the Lord uses that so that there would be a, a lot of people there. It's interesting, the Lord kind of takes the, the position that I was in the temple all of that time. Why do you come to me with hundreds of people? At any time, if I was that much of a seditionist, if I was that much of a bad person, why didn't you just take me while I was there? You didn't have to bring all these people. You don't have to have swords, lanterns, and all that sort of thing. You have to do it in secret in the middle of the night. You could have kept people asleep <laughs> and just come and take me in the temple any time, which is a very good point, isn't it? So if they didn't have a problem with him while he was in the temple, it's not like he was doing it secretively. If he was a seditionist, he would have done it secretively, certainly. But he, he taught openly. He, he didn't make any, uh, you know, he, it, it wasn't a cult. It wasn't a cult following. It wasn't secret. It wasn't a secret society. Um, he was open about it. All right, so uh, that coupled with the fact, now let's remember too, that it was the Passover time. So were there a lot of people in the city, a lot of Jews, lots of tents set up, okay? You had the, the, the Feast of Tabernacles and Passover were typically consecutive. And the Jews would stay there all the way through that, uh, through that time. And so there were a lot of people there, tons of people in the city, more so than in any other time of the year, maybe. Uh, there were civilian, by uh, 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 um, I should say, I don't know if obvious, but uh, probably there were civilians among the band also, just passers-by. When you see hundreds of people going somewhere, it arouses curiosity and attention of some. Undoubtedly, that was also the case. So here's what we have. Um, now, the Lord... He uh, <clears throat> expresses his deity when he says, I am. When he says that, they, they fall backward. It's the pronouncement of his deity, okay, and his power. Um, basically, uh, and the way I take it is this. You remember later on that Pilate tells the Lord, don't you know that I have this power? He says, I have the power. It's invested in him. And the Lord said, you would have no power unless God gave it to you. So I think to this band of people that were coming, Jesus was in a way saying, I'm the one that, that has the power, okay? and I'm allowing you to do this because nobody can t could, could have taken Jesus' life. If he was not a sinner, as the Bible said, it would, th then the curse of death was never upon him, ever. So he could not have died. The only way that he could have perished was for him to offer his own life up, which, of course, he did. Uh, then, how does Judas designate who the Lord was? He gives him a sign of affection. Now here the King James translators translated that sign of affection as a kiss. So uh, whether or not he, he now that, and that was also typically the way that uh, people would have greeted one another. I think you understand that in some cultures it's that way. And so that, but basically the Greek word simply means, uh, sign, it's phileo actually, which is, would be like a phileo love. And so it was simply a, uh, 
a, uh, a camaraderie sort of a sign of affection. You might, somebody that you know that you haven't seen in a while, okay, and they'll come to somewhere or whatever, you might, you might embrace them, hug them and say welcome, right? That might be a way that you do that. Um, at the very least, you'd shake their hand. Uh, maybe put your arm around them and say, come on, come on in, whatever. But there are signs, right? We, we show uh, the, the, this. In, now, uh, those of us in the north here are typically a lot more colder and distant <laughs> than, than and certainly in uh, other cultures also. Um, so, it, in other, it's, so we're much less so. Uh, even uh, northern Europeans, I guess, which is a lot of where our culture comes from, they're just very cold and distant. So different cultures have different ways of, of showing this. And that's why to us, this idea of kissing and all that is kind of you know, you know, repulsive in a way it's because we're not just not that close. And there's a space, right? If, I, if I'm talking to Robert, this is a comfortable space. If I get right here and start talking, he's going to start backing off like, dude, back away from me. What are you doing? Right? Because we're not used to that. When I was in Japan, um, they would get right in your grill, <laughs> right in there. You know, they bow, but they don't bow here. They're right up in there. So I was like, whoa, and they're all this big, you know, so... <laughs> Thinking, okay, this is weird. And then we, and in, in, in Tokyo especially, they uh, are like sardines in, in those yeah. subway systems. You know, they, in fact, they've got people working in the subway systems whose a job apparently was to see if you could pack as many people as they can and get the door shut in the subway. And I mean, I've got pictures somewhere where uh, I'm hanging, you know, the bar is up here. Now, none of them, because this is funny, none of them can reach the bar. They couldn't reach it. So I'm reaching up like, oh, man. And because you feel the weight of all these people and the subway goes and stops. I mean, there were people everywhere. I felt like, oh, I'm very uncomfortable. And so I'm grabbing this bar, trying to hold everybody out back in the other way. They thought it was crazy, undoubtedly. But... Um, but so they're used to that space, right? And it's a little bit closer for whatever reason. But it's funny how that is, funny how society is. is, uh, is. So here in this side, it was, it was probably a side, the side of affection was a lot more close than something that we would be used to. Okay, now let's talk about this betrayal. And this is going to be important. I want you to remember this. I'm going to give you four reasons why betrayal was necessary. There are other ways that the Lord have, could have been given into the hands of those that would have crucified him. There are lots of other ways. Betrayal was uh, the way that it happened, but it, I think that it was necessary. And it was necessary for three reasons. Okay, number one, we'll look at that this is an if and then thing. Okay, let's look at the four other ways that he could have been captured. Number one is just that he could have been captured as in a conflict. So if the Lord would have been captured in, the, in, in a conflict, an armed conflict, all right, Betrayal, uh, he, he was betrayed by one of his friends, so there wasn't any conflict involved. And however, however, it could have happened that way. So if he had been captured in conflict, what would that have made the Lord? It would have made him then unwilling to do that, right? Well, that doesn't follow, follow Scripture. So if he were to have been captured in conflict, it would, that could not have been because he was a willing sacrifice. So that couldn't have been. Number two, he could have been captured fleeing. Right? So he could have fled. Once again, if, if the Lord would have ran away uh, from this situation and then he would have been captured as a fugitive, then he would have been a victim. Now, was he a victim? There again, he was not. He gave of his own self. He was not a victim. He was not a victim of circumstances. He wasn't uh, this hunted prey. Or, or, you know, he, was, he willingly gave himself. So he couldn't have been captured fleeing. Thirdly, he could have surrendered. He could have turned himself in, as it were. That could have been a way that they could have, they could have gotten him. But that would have made, if he would have surrendered, that would have made Christ uh, guilty. Right? And he was not guilty. He was just, now he was going to take on sin, but he hadn't yet. And so he was not guilty. So a person that is not guilty has nothing to fear. So why should he surrender? There's nothing for him to surrender for. Again, he was in the temple openly every day. Nothing for him to surrender about. So he couldn't have been captured. He, he couldn't have been ca uh, uh, fleeing. Couldn't have surrendered. And then another reason, maybe, is that he was taken unawares. In other words, he didn't know it was going to happen. Uh, they surprised him. It was a covert operation. And he was taken unawares. He was hiding. He was holed up somewhere. And they, and they, they took him. They had a a superior espionage and reconnaissance teams out there, and they found out where he was and they captured him like Saddam Hussein. Yes. Well, that also could not have happened 
because the Bible, remember I said that the, he knew all things that were going to happen to him, right? The scripture says that. So he knew he was going to be captured. There were, he was not unaware of it, okay? This would take away from his deity and his omni, omniscience. So if he could not have been, if they couldn't have gotten him through capture, through fleeing, through surrender, through being taken <laughs> unawares, there is only one way, and it was betrayal. So betrayal was necessary for those reasons. Any other seeming way that he could have been uh, uh, apprehended would have been uh, counter scripture. Okay, so even in his betrayal, it was necessary for those reasons. Okay, uh, now this betrayal, again, number one, we said there's no other way, and we, we covered those. Number two, betrayal is sin shown at its worst. Right? So we're just kind of listing why betrayal was necessary. Number one, because there was no other way. We covered that. Number two is because it shows sin at its very worst. Um, it, it, it is one of the, as, and I kind of opened by saying that, it's one of the worst things. To be betrayed is one of the, the most terrible things. So it contributes to the Lord's humility and uh, in, in the fact that it was, he was betrayed. So it's one of the worst sins because what is involved in betrayal? Planning, uh, deceit, lying, um, and there was even money involved. Okay, so... Normally, blackmail and deceit and all of that is, and betrayal involves money. Why do people do it? Because they benefit monetarily from it. And so they are on purpose lying and deceitful. So all of this is, is involved in this betrayal, so it's a terrible sin. Uh, thirdly, uh, the betrayal was necessary because of prophecy. Psalm 41.9 tells us, or gives us an idea that the Lord would have been uh, betrayed when it says, <clears throat> Yea, mine own familiar friend, <clears throat> excuse me, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. So here David in Psalm 41, Messianic Psalm, indicates that the Lord, the Messiah, was going to be taken through betrayal. Certainly that was the case. So why was betrayal necessary? Because it fulfilled prophecy, because it shows sin at its worst, because there was no other way. And then fourthly, because he could sympathize with us. Remember the Bible teaches that the Lord was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. So how could our Lord be compassionate towards those who are betrayed now if he did not himself suffer that betrayal? That's the idea. Um, <clears throat> so all the more reason if we feel betrayed by family, if we feel betrayed by, and, and, and the closer we are to the people, the more the betrayal we'll feel. Okay? When family members forsake you, they don't go to your wedding, they don't uh, support you in your decisions, they're, they're basically gone. Uh, that's... That's tough, okay? But the Lord felt betrayal far worse than that even. So he understands, and that's, that helps us. And then fifthly, uh, we see the betrayal is necessary because of Peter. It helped Peter to see his place. Because our Lord was betrayed, it caused Peter to have to back what he said. Okay, so we're kind of trace it, really. So Peter said, I'll never leave you, even though everybody else leaves you. I am not going to, right? And so when the betrayal happened, and it was Judas, gave Peter the opportunity to back what he said, right? But he used a sword. So later on, when the Lord helps Peter to understand, he says, do you love me? And he says those three times, and we'll get into some of that. Then it caused Peter to understand, undoubtedly in his mind, he put all these things together. That even though he picks up the sword and uses it, even though he said he was going to do it, he was operating by the... See, Peter was a person that operated uh, according to his flesh and his self. Okay? Um, so it helped him to understand that when he defended himself, the Lord heals his ear. Uh, he ends up denying him even though he picked up the sword. So all these things help Peter, Peter to see this isn't the way it works. It can't, it can't work this way. And then later on, of course, the Lord helps him to see that. So betrayal helped <coughs> Peter to... It really made him. Uh, and then, uh, sixthly, the reason why it was necessary betrayal because the disciples flew, flew, flight, flewed. Is that how you say it? They flew, flighted. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. The, the Dunn left him. All right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll put it They done left him. <laughs> right. So you got that one, right? All right, we're rednecks. So uh, it was the flight there of the disciple. Of course, that was also a fulfillment of Scripture. You strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. The Bible says that. So 
Um, that was also the fulfillment of the prophecy. So you see, betrayal was really the only way. Okay, so he is taken. We've covered the betrayal. Now let's look at the examination um, by, oh, we'll just make it general. We'll say Jesus' trial. Look at that. And the first thing we'll talk about is his trial before Annas. Now, Annas was a former high priest, and in New Testament history we learned that Herod the great son, Herod Archelaus, took the throne. Uh, but he fell into disfavor with Rome, and he was banished. When that happened, the governor of Syria took over the governorship of Judea, and his name was Quirinius. Okay? And so Quirinius placed Annas as the high priest. You know, that was a big thing in history because nobody before that time had placed a high priest on the throne. That was supposed to be Jewish. But here we have a Roman governor uh, placing his own high priest. So, well, that was Annas. Right? When Annas uh, no longer fulfilled the seat, he found a way to get his son-in-law in there, okay, which was Caiaphas. But apparently, uh, Annas was also a, what do you want to call it? A, uh, what do you call it? When they... A uh, pastor, uh, when, when he's still there, but he's quit the... Pastor emeritus. emeritus. yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. Maybe he was a high priest emeritus, you know, uh, something like that. So Annas was still there. In fact, had some measure of uh, authority, diplomacy, uh, because he had a court there, and he still had all of those things. We have a really a kind of official presentation before Annas. So, um, so that's kind of the, some of the history of, of Annas. And he was, in this uh, questioning, uh, look at verse 19 here uh, in John chapter 18, if you're still there. It says, the high priest then asked Jesus of, now it says two things. He asked him of his, now we're going we're to discuss this. I asked him of two basic things. He asked him of his disciples and then of his doctrine. All right, now, what was Annas trying to do? Well, I would suggest that he was trying to make Jesus incriminate himself. This was kind of the policy all along. A lot of the questions that the people who were questioning the Lord would say, is it right, for example, to uh, pay tribute to Caesar? Well, that was because they were trying to trap him at his words, right? What's, what's the general word for all of that is to incriminate? Uh, incrimination, and that is making oneself guilty, Okay, is part of, even in our own country, what is called the Fifth Amendment. You've heard of I plead the Fifth. What does that really mean? It means that you do not have to incriminate yourself. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to answer the questions. Okay, you have the freedom of, to say nothing. And this is so that the person that is brought before trial, the things that that person has said, could not be used against him. Do you see the idea? So that's really the purpose of our Fifth Amendment. Okay. And so in, in, in Jewish uh, society, it was also the case, one could not incriminate himself. All right? So now in the, in the official trial, when he's in the witness stand, well, that's a little bit different. But before the trial, okay, the, the words that are said, now, if the person says those words, that's up to them. A lot of people do, okay, and, they, and they're incriminated. But you don't have to. You can plead the fifth. This is the idea. So for, for them to add, now, did, did, is the Lord in an official trial here? It's not an official trial. They wanted, ultimately, to bring him to trial in Rome because they wanted to be rid of him. We know that. Okay, I don't have to go through that again. We know that they wanted him gone. They wanted Lazarus gone also. That was it. That was it. They, they, were, they were going to do whatever they had to do to make sure he was done. So uh, they brought him in. It was sort of a mock trial. And what they were trying... So because it wasn't the official trial yet, did the Lord have to say anything? He didn't have to. He didn't have to incriminate himself. Okay, and this is a, a lar to a large degree why he didn't say anything. It wasn't an official trial. But yet they asked him questions. So here he is standing there, and they're firing questions at him. And they asked him about two things. One about his disciples. Why would they ask him about his disciples? In what way, what were they trying to hear from the Lord's words that would incriminate himself regarding his disciples? That is not rhetorical. In other words, I want an answer from you. We have a giant think tank here. You at least have one collective neuron working, at least, <laughs> collectively. It's on the fritz, but there's a connection there. <laughs> so instead of blindly writing down notes, anybody can do that, I want you to think. Ha ha. <laughs> you know those intangible things that go through your head, those thoughts? I think you have them, typically. Yes? Is that they could, uh, you could maybe say that you know, if I 
kind accusation against his uh, disciples of the people he, he was hanging on with, association. We've established that, but what exactly about those disciples? Think about the disciples. What kind of people were they? How could he be incriminated? He's trying to figure out if they were criminals. Maybe. Who was Matthew? Okay, so do you think they asked him about Matthew probably? And what way they would incriminate himself then? He hangs out with tax collectors, publicans, right? It's an incrimination. Uh, were his disciples these fine, upstanding people of society? Were they Pharisees and Sadducees? <laughs> no. Okay, his disciples were other people. They were fishermen. They were common people. They didn't know anything. They didn't grow up underneath the uh, feet of Gamaliel as Paul did. Okay, this fine, it wasn't that way. So he's asking about his disciples and trying to criminate. And then about his doctrine. Well, I think that's pretty clear, right? They, this is not unlike what they had been doing all the way through. So they would ask him many times concerning his doctrine. For example, is it right to pay tribute to Caesar? They would say that he is um, somebody that's teaching against Moses' law. Remember they said that? He says he, they, 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 he's saying that it's okay to... Um, or, and then later on when Paul brought Jews, or uh, excuse me, Gentiles into the court. Wow, oh, you know, this is... So this is incrimination, your doctrine. What do you teach? This is not right. You have no authority. That was a big thing. <clears throat> By what authority are you teaching these things? He spoke authoritatively, but by what authority they would say these things? All right, so they were trying to incriminate him as they had all along based on those two things. <clears throat> all right. Um, now, uh, so he, he did not defraud himself at all or incriminate himself. Um, primarily, okay, logically, because he wasn't guilty. You can't incriminate yourself when you have, well, you can't incriminate yourself when you haven't been guilty when you say something you're not supposed to. But when you're not guilty, you, you don't have to say anything. It'll stand on its own. So this is the case. All right, now, uh, there's, so before Annas, let's talk about his trial before Caiaphas. Now, this is a little bit more of an official because Caiaphas at this time was the uh, high priest that was standing in there, although it is pretty apparent that Annas was trying to make the high priesthood a dynasty. This is why he had his son-in-law in there. And uh, so, he, he brings witnesses. Now, Caiaphas' um, trial was a bit more, oh, uh, I guess you could say serious. Uh, I think maybe Annas was just uh, doing some preliminary questioning, and undoubtedly it was so that Caiaphas can gather together the witnesses they needed. But the Bible teaches us that they brought, um, you know, so verse 15, let me just read it. Um, let's see. We are in, I believe, Luke 22. Go there. Here we read a little bit more about this. In Luke 22, verse 69. Uh, 60, sorry, let me back up here. Yeah, sorry, let me back up a little bit. 66. And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together and led him into their council, saying, Art thou the Christ? Tell us. And he said unto them, if, if I tell you, ye will not believe. So he doesn't really answer the question there. Again, he's not trying to incriminate himself. And if I also ask you, you will not answer me, nor let me go. So it's not going to make a difference. I can answer either way, and I'm going to let me go. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. And then said they all, Art thou the Son of God? And he said unto them, Ye say that I am. And they said, What need have we of further witnesses? For ourselves we have heard of this own mouth. But these witnesses that were brought before him were witnesses that were un... Mm, they weren't true witnesses. They were trying once again to make him incriminate himself. And in fact, one of the witnesses said that... This man said that if he destroyed the temple, we will build it again in three days. And so they're trying to, to make him a seditionist, somebody that was working against the government that was in place, like Rome, because he would be the kind of people that... So if he's talking about every stone being dropped down, apparently he was trying to lead... Now, you can look at it in two ways. The Lord here apparently is trying to lead an army against Jerusalem. That's why he's going to knock down the temple. So you see how you can twist the words? Now we know, according to the Gospel of John, that he's talking about his, the temple of his body. He's talking about his resurrection. But could you easily twist those words to make him a revolutionist, a seditionist? You could, and this is what they did. So um, these are some of the people that were brought before him. Um, now when they finally officially proclaimed him a blasphemist, and here he said, what, what need have we of any other witnesses? We have heard ourselves out of his own mouth. I believe the book of Matthew says, 
that it was blasphemy. In fact, the high priest tore his robes, right? a sign of, of having heard blasphemy. Now, according to Old Testament law, there's a, quite a few things that are wrong with this trial. Okay, number one, uh, they, they could not, they had to have more than one witness. Now, according to this trial, they had one witness at a time, right? So this was not proper. Deuteronomy 17, 6, that you could, it has to be by the mouth of at least two witnesses. So the same thing had to come out of the mouth of at least two witnesses, but that doesn't seem to have been the case. Also, um, the result of blasphemy, according to Leviticus 24, 16, was that he was to have been stoned by the whole town, all of the people. So blasphemy uh, in Leviticus was deemed a punishable by stoning, but everybody was supposed to stone this person, not just a, a handful. So according to Jewish law, for him to be put to death by Rome was not even, uh, if, if the charge was blasphemy, it was not a proper way. Okay, we know that. So, um, okay, so... Let's talk a little bit more about Peter's trial. Okay, so that's Jesus' trial before those two. I'm not, not Peter's uh, trial, Peter's uh, denial. All right. Okay, the denial of Peter. He followed far off, we know that. Uh, John was there, allowed him to be able to come in. And he denies him three times. In fact, he denied him with an oath. I know not the man. And then he even uh, cursed and swears and this sort of thing and undoubtedly swears on his mom's grave and all the rest of that sort of thing. You know, that's how things were done. And uh, it, just to give you an idea how people do that. So he swore. And uh, there, are, there are groups of threes in Peter's life. There are four groups of threes. And so this seems to be kind of a thing for him. He makes, for example, number one, <clears throat> I want you to remember this, three confessions of loyalty. Uh, he confesses uh, that he is, in Matthew 26, he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Uh, well, I don't know if he says it just like that, but he says, I'll, even though everybody else says, I will never do that. He does that twice in the book of Matthew. And then in the book of John, chapter 6, he that is there where he says, where will we go? Remember the Lord says that many disciples left him at that time, and the Lord says, will you go also? And Peter pipes up and says, where will we go? For you have the words of life. So there Peter is giving a confession of loyalty, and he says, we're not going to go anywhere. You have the words of life. So three times in Peter's life, we know at least, he gives confessions of loyalty. Three times he was caught sleeping. Remember that in the Garden of Gethsemane? That's another three there. <laughs> he was caught sleeping three, thrice. And of course, here we see that he denies Christ three times. So this group of three happened pretty soon, one right after another one, right? Gethsemane, and then three times he denies him. But thank goodness... Uh, toward the end there, Peter, Peter makes three, a threefold confession of Christ when he says, lovest thou me? And Peter says, you know that I love you. So that was also three times. So there seems to be a, uh, a thing of, of three times in Peter's life. Okay. Um, and then he's brought before um, the, this official charge of blasphemy. By the way, an official charge, according to Jewish law, was to be done one day afterwards. So according to Jewish law, they were supposed to hear the trial, then they were supposed to wait an entire day, and then come up with the uh, verdict. So here we see that it was the very next morning they came up with the verdict, so they did not follow a Levitical law at all, even in that. Um, and, and what do you suppose that's for? It's so that there won't be an emotional decision. I think even in our own court system, the jury takes a... Um, you know, they go off somewhere and they discuss these things. And so that the impassioned um, emotions involved in the trial will not lead people to make a decision. It was a similar here, but they did it the very next day. So was emotion involved in it? Well, it was. <laughs> they were very emotionally charged. And so they made a, a decision based on that. Anyway, it was going to happen. Okay, um, this person, then he's brought before Pilate. Okay, just a couple things about Pilate. We, we don't have much time left. Um, so let me just give you the things that you're going to need to know. Um, no, so being brought before Pilate, he had already been before Annas, Caiaphas. He had given the official pronouncement of, of blasphemy. He's brought before Pilate. Later on, Pilate has him um, scourged 
we, we, he, he takes him to Herod when he realized that it may be part of, now it's not Herod Archelaus, it's a different one. Uh, this is, and he's brought before Herod, and that was kind of a mock trial. They put him in a purple robe and all of that. Well, when that didn't go anywhere, he brought him back to Pilate again. So the Romans really don't know what to do with him. He's causing a problem, and they don't really have any official pronouncement of a crime against him. So he's brought again before Pilate again. Pilate then, now he's got to do something with it. He undoubtedly was hoping that Herod would take care of it. He wouldn't have to worry about it. When he's brought back again, Part of the way that he's, and he, seven times he pronounces, if all the way through with all the different Gospels, he, there's a seven-time pronouncement that Pilate makes of the innocency of Christ, whether he officially pronounces it or um, takes other means of punishment to deny the fact that he was guilty. Either way, that's done seven times, seven being the number of completion. There may be something there. So he is completely innocent. Uh, Pilate washes his hands, right? He has him scourged primarily so that to placate any kind of emotion that the Jews would have against Christ if they saw that he was scourged so terribly. And according to the book of Isaiah, he was uh, unrecognizable as a man. That should have been enough for them. At least Pilate was hoping, but it wasn't. So everything he could do to try to, to, try to make him. And then he brings a Barabbas. Then he brings a horrible person. Surely this man Christ and Barabbas, surely they're going to pick uh, Christ to let him go over Barabbas. So you see all of these things all together. Seven things. Pilate was really trying to not charge him. Okay, um, even his wife warned him, Pilate. You know, her name was Claudia. She has a history too. We won't get into all of that. But uh, even she tried to warn him. And uh, the, the charges that they brought before Rome, now it would be different uh, to charge the Lord in Roman law, would have been different from Jewish law to them. Okay, what does Pilate care about blasphemy? The Jews said he was a blasphemer. That would have been important to the Jews, but the Romans don't. He, don't, he doesn't care about that. He blasphemes who? Your God? He's got a, you know, a hundred gods. Big deal. You know, it doesn't matter to him. So they had to bring up other things. And this is where they brought up sedition. He was teaching against uh, the, the government of Rome. He, he didn't pay tribute to Caesar. These things were brought up. They were trying to just incriminate him. Okay? And then finally, the final thing, um, even though Pilate never officially admits it, uh, he was trying to be uh, king. He says that he was king of the Jews. So that's what Pilate says, are you king of the Jews? He says, and, and even the Jews themselves said, we have no king but Caesar. And so if the Lord is trying to be king, apparently he's trying to overthrow Caesar's throne. And so clearly he should be put to death. This was the idea. But Pilate didn't see anything in that, but he questioned him regarding it. And this is when he finally says, well, it's my job to make sure that this thing is quelled. And so he puts him to death. Five things about Pilate real quick and we'll be done. Number one, Pilate was not known as a very nice person. He was rather a wicked and cruel person. Uh, he didn't favor the Jewish people very much. It tells us in Luke 13, 1, there were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifice. So he was a, apparently he was, a, he was sacrificing things uh, to their gods, even to, in, on the Jewish altar, that were not to be done. So he wasn't, he wasn't in particular very favored toward uh, the Jews. And so he was a violent and he was a cruel person. He had, number two, paintings of Caesar placed in the temple. We know that <clears throat> uh, through history. And so trying to make the temple uh, part of the imperial worship, which the Jews, of course, would have been opposed to. Uh, he, thirdly, used temple funds to build aqueducts. So the temple funds were supposed to be used for the temple. And uh, the Jewish people gave those things for the work of the Lord, but he took those things and used them for his own projects there. So he, I'm just trying to show you he wasn't a big friend of the Jews. He was uh, married into Caesar's family. He himself did not have an official uh, place there, but by marriage he uh, obtained the position that he did because he married into Caesar's family, that is Tiberius. So Claudia, his uh, was daughter of Tiberius, or at least an adopted daughter of Tiberius. And uh, lastly, of course, Pilate was, Pilate was given the governorship of Herod's dynasty. Quirinius, for a time, had taken it over, and then Pilate was given that governorship um, of Herod's dynasty there. Um, so these are the things we... So Pilate, in no way, in pronouncing, and I guess in the summary of all of this, and we'll be done here, is that Pilate wasn't didn't favor the Jews and didn't pronounce Christ innocent because he, uh, or, or not guilty or guilty, 
because he wanted to placate the Jews. It would have been simple for Pilate to placate the Jews to have immediately just pronounced him guilty because that's what the Jews wanted. But he never did favor the Jews very much. So here we have even somebody that um, didn't just give the Jews what they wanted to. He never had, did have a history of that and yet was unable to, to release the Lord. Now, why, why is that? Because Jesus gave up his own life, okay? And it was going to happen one way or another. Pilate was just a pawn in the, in the chess game, if you will. Okay, that's it for today. We'll, we'll talk about, uh, and now there is no quiz, so you can use time to work on your paper. And we'll talk about the crucifixion next time.